Hey guys, today we're going to look at one um, mistake, if you want to call it that, that a lot of people make when doing the Vin Fletcher's Arrows Challenge, and which is one of a series of several challenges um, that I'll kind of build on this. Uh, so, and, and I do want to say, this is not a mistake per se, but I do think it's something that deserves discussion. So you can make the decision wisely instead of by coincidence. And the mistake is this, uh, adding your console input directly into the arrow class. So if we look at the at, at this set of challenges, the first one asks you to make an arrow class with some fields for the different attributes of an arrow. Uh, and then it asks you to compute the cost in a method. And we're going to skip the cost calculation part for what I'm doing here. Um, but importantly, it does this challenge does ask you to get the values from the user from the console window. Now, I think that that is, like it's, it actually, if you look at this code, like a good chunk of it, like all of this stuff here, this and this and this is all about user input. There's like, that's a good chunk of the code is just for user input, um, which kind of clouds like what you're trying to do with classes. Um, but I do think it's a useful thing to do. I think it's important to be able to handle this sort of user input stuff because why do anything if we can't, you know, get, input from the user at some level or another um, where the, the software exists for the users. Um, so I do think there's a lot of value in this, but I do think that the way that it's in the book, the way it shows up has a tendency to send people down a particular, a, a particular path unwittingly. Um, and I want to give some extra food for thought to sort of counterbalance that tendency. Um, so that's what I want to do here. So anyway, the code usually ends up looking something like this. Um, and, and some people do this a different way and, and it's fine, but um, just go with me here. So like the, 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 this code, um, and like I said, if you're, if you're in this boat, if, if you got sent a link to this video because you were doing this, you are in really good company. There are so many people who do this. And again, I'll say again, this isn't, I've, I said it was a mistake. Um, it isn't, it isn't other than you don't want to be making a choice like this because you didn't realize that there's alternatives. Um, you want to do it because you feel like it's the right choice for what you're trying to achieve. And it very well might be. So we'll get into that. But this is what it usually looks like. So you have a, a, a public class arrow. Oh, actually, <laughs> I'm kind of jumping around a little bit. In my head, it's really easy to just like, just type out the code how I would type it. We technically haven't really talked about accessibility levels at this point in the book. Um, I, my initial, when I first wrote this up, I made properties. Like, there's a bunch of things like I would write this code a little bit different for a lot of reasons, but I'm trying to stick here to, I probably put public on these enumerations down here too. I'm trying to keep this, um, at a level of what you see when you get to the, that first Vin Fletcher's arrows challenge. But so you end up with something like this. You have a, a an arrow class that you defined, and then you have some properties. You may or may not have put a cost property in here as well. And then um, you have a constructor for it, which you're supposed to have. Um, but this type of thing here is is common. So either so the user input either just gets dropped like right in here. You know, you have fletching type equals console dot read line. You know, use something like that where you just get that input directly from the user right here, or something like this where we say, well, let's let's make some methods for it, which I think is a good idea. You know, to have these different methods. And I've like I haven't done too much. Like I I didn't even bother to like. My user input here was bare bones. I just did it as simple as possible. Like, unless you know how the code works, you'll never guess what your allowed options here are, but don't like that's irrelevant for what we're talking about here. So pay no attention to the garbage code behind the curtain here. Anyway, but that's the idea is you, you, um, you just get the user input and you just save it off to your, your fields here. Um, and then all you have to do up here to get this arrow is you just say new arrow. And it will just, like, when you say new arrow, it will just go to the console window and just get that user input. Um, and then I have some code here that will display it. So we can see how this runs here really quick. Um, so now I have to remember what this was. So let's do um, plastic fletching and a steel arrowhead and a length of, I don't know, 78 centimeters. So I type all that in and now it gives me this arrow. And it, it's all, it's convenient. Um, so, like I said, it's not unreasonable that people would arrive at code that follows this general pattern. Um, 
So let's now talk about why there's a part of my brain that says maybe maybe we should maybe we should pull this code out of this class and either put it in the main method or in maybe even a whole other class like we could make some a class whose whose purpose is um, getting you know creating an arrow from user input. So um, when it comes to objects and object-oriented design, and this is one of those things that the book is getting to, like there's there's a lot of chapters at this point in the book that deal with object-oriented objects and object-oriented design. Um, but I I wish I had made this a little clearer, and I expect to make some changes in future editions to make this a little easier to understand. But in the meantime, why not a video, right? Um, when it comes to objects and object oriented design, one of the most useful tools um, that you have for knowing where one class should end and another should begin is volatility. Um, this, like in in the industry, this is this is phrased as like there's a there's one there's a, a, a principle that goes encapsulate the concept that varies. It's the same idea. Um, or there's another philosophy that says. Uh, that you should use volatility-based decomposition. Same idea. Um, the single responsibility principle is saying the exact same thing, though that one, the single responsibility principle, is very often misunderstood. People will say things like, well, each class should do only one thing and it should do it well. And that's actually not the single responsibility principle. Um, not what, it, like, at its core, what it really is, is trying to say. It's this idea of um, the volatility. And let me explain what I mean by that. So I'm going to, at this point, I'm going to actually delete all this code here. And I'm going to start writing some code that's like, makes a lot of classes. And I think like, don't, especially if you're at the Vin Fletcher's arrows, like you, you've seen the rectangle class, you've, you've made your own arrow class. Like you've only worked with a few classes. So I'm going to be throwing out a lot here. You don't like, don't feel like you got to keep up with every little detail. Um, but just like it's the concepts that are important here, right? Um, so let's suppose you have a game that has a level and it's like this grid based like dungeon crawl, you know, you go room to room um, and there's, you know, there might be doors between it and um, uh, there might be monsters in it. There might be treasure like I, whatever it is. It's that kind of thing where you just wander through this dungeon, collect things, find items like whatever it is, um, is what you're trying to build. And so you have a level class, and I like I, I don't have much here, but imagine the details. I, in fact, I'm going to write in the next little bit. I'm going to write a lot of code that doesn't even compile. You'll have to use your imagination. Um, code that could compile if we put the right stuff in there, but I'm not going to flesh it all out. Um, so let's suppose though, like there's we have this like again this thing of like the level like some something needs to like create the level. Something needs to populate it with actual specific um, data. And I think it, like, this is the kind of thing where you might say, well, my plan is, is for these levels, I want to randomly generate it. Um, like that's just how I expect the game to work is just random generation. I think like, that's a good strategy. Like it makes sense to be able to do that. Um, but, but it, this is one of those things where, um, you, you should stop and ask yourself, is, is that the way that levels are generated? volatile is it something that like i might change my mind on um because if it if the, if it's something that you might change your mind on then you then you want that, that that's what i'm trying the principle i'm trying to get at here is that, that is that volatility thing if you think you might change your mind about how you're approaching something like using a totally different strategy then you want to separate that from from, from things that are that from code that is unrelated to that. So it could mean make a separate class. Um, it could mean make a whole group of separate classes. Like you may, the, 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 the strategy for doing something may be, may span, who knows, one class or, or three classes or a hundred classes. And that's fine. But the code for handling that like area of volatility should be separated from, from code that is not related to that like area of volatility at all. So the random, like the, this idea of like level generation, we could just like come in here and say, well, I'm going to have my constructor 
just generate a level randomly you know and we just come in here and we just start generating things randomly like depending on the size and maybe this is like an int like rows and an int columns or whatever and we just you know make the board and just start generating stuff randomly um the the thing about that is that there is no at that point there is no way to use a level without it being randomly created and that means among other things you must solve the random level problem before you can do anything else it also means like if you want to test out some specific scenario you're out of luck like there's no way to use a level the level class unless it's randomized um so it takes away a lot of options and you don't have that flexibility um, and sometimes sometimes you so whenever you have these things that come up you have to stop and ask yourself is like are there different strategies that i actually might want to apply because you could take this what we're about to do here you could take it to an extreme and say well anything could change and then just do a whole bunch of extra stuff for things that you know are not really ever going to change um and and then you just make like it, it had these things adding in this extra basically extra classes adds more code it adds more elements it actually complicates the code but hopefully it's done strategically in ways that'll that make it really trivial to change your mind about how you're doing it so um anyway so let's let's talk about the the, the this concept of like the the level generation like yes we could do it put some comments in here some some strategy so we could do it let's see we could do it randomly um, but like, we could also have like a file-based system. Um, like we could just have like data in a text file or uh, a JSON file or an XML file or you know whatever it is. There's a lot of different formats that we could use. Some sort of custom format, like whatever it is that we want, we could make this this file format. Which also actually that allows us to make our, a totally separate like level editor that you go in and like place things, and then it saves it to that file format. So like. Even, even if we want to support like random generation, oops, if we want to support random generation, having like a file-based thing could be a really useful tool. Um, we can think of some other options here too. So like um, maybe it doesn't go in like the, a file in the file system. Maybe there's some database and all the data comes out of that. We go talk to the database and get the level data. Um, and, and that could be like a database on, you know, in the cloud. Amazon Web Services or Azure or something like that. We, it could be there. It could be something we go get the data from there. But it could just be some sort of local database too, like a SQLite database. Or there's a lot of database options. So it could be something like that. Or um, we could ask this like a server. There could be a web server that just gives us the files. And and that one convenient thing about that is files that are on people's file system. We can't just like update. Like if we realize there's some horrible problem with a level, we don't have to. We can just change it and now everybody when they open up that level it like it'll just be updated because we go to the server and ask for it but it requires an internet connection so trade-offs um but so all these things are options and i think we could come up with even more options like there's really like the, the point here is that we have lots of options but one other thing that i do definitely want to include in here is a hard-coded option and people kind of sneer turn up their nose at hard-coded stuff just because well it shouldn't be in the code it should be configurable um, but one thing I will say and I'm going to walk through this as an example here in a second is that every single one of these other problems uh, or other um, strategies is very complicated like it has complexity to it so for example like you don't want to randomly generate a level where I don't know you like there's a, a a monster in the first room before you had any chances to pick up any weapons or um, you don't want to like a you don't want to spawn the key randomly be like where the only place that it is is behind a locked door or you don't want to like generate it where like there's like walls between things and you can't actually get across like there's a lot of complexity to that even some of this like file based stuff like there's overhead for that. Um, if you want to, like, you introduce, like, you're sitting there saying, oh, I want to introduce a new, a new thing. Maybe it's, um, I don't know, um, you know, you're adding in monsters, you're adding in treasure chests or something like that. Like, you, you may have to include extra code to handle, um, being able to like read that type of information out of a file or out of a database or, or from the server, not to mention you might have to add in your 
you know, your level editor program, the, the code to like actually add that in. So any little concept that you come up with before you can actually do anything with it, you've got to go do a whole bunch of other work. And that's true for the database and the server. In fact, those are probably worse than the file based one for that. But to be able to just have a hard coded thing, it makes it really convenient. So I'm going to actually make a little bit of that here. Again, this is the part I said, I'm going to write a lot of code here. Um, where, yeah, yeah. So I'm going to just make it, make this class here. Um, I'm just going to write a bunch of code. That's not necessarily going to be like make, like it's not going to compile and that's okay. But, um, yeah, so we're like, we could like this code could go right here in this constructor, but I, I'll show you in a second, like the, the flexibility that we're getting by having this, by separating this thing. It's like, we we recognize these are like legitimate viable strategies why we might do one thing over another. Um, like, like we may change our minds on it. it. We may, we may start with hard code. We may start with a randomly generated thing. So um, I'll just make another little class here, public level generate. Um, level. And let's pass in some dimensions and we'll return level Return 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 level. And then in here, so this is the part where I'm going to just start writing a bunch of code that doesn't necessarily compile, but like we can do like level dot rooms at some location equals new prison cell. All this stuff is stuff that doesn't exist yet, but it could if we wanted to. So maybe we can make, so, you know, we can add a, a prison cell to a room and we can um, add a throne room or let's see, we could do level dot rooms at some other location and we'll do something like monsters dot add new skeleton, which would be yet another class. Um, all of these would be classes. Throne would be a class. Prison cell would be a class. Skeleton would be a class. We just, you know, all this stuff this rooms thing could be a two-dimensional array that we just defined down in here. Um, little dot. Oh, then we could do something like this, like put in a locked door. So we can do like a locked door. Maybe locked door, which could be yet another class. <laughs> um, level dot room zero two dot entrances dot north equals door. So we put the door in into that room on its north entrance. And then we say, get it not a key, not down, just a key. That's one of the problems with um, just writing a bunch of code here that doesn't compile is Visual Studio really wants me to use stuff that it can find. And so wanted me to use that. I don't even remember what that was. Key, key not found exception. Um, so we get the key from the door and then we'll do something like this level dot room, pick another room dot items dot add new chest, which could be another class key. Um, anyway, the point here is that like these, all these classes, all these objects, like we're going to, again, a, a kind of a glimpsing ahead at the future of what it could be um, like the level, like, could be made up of a lot of rooms that have different classes for room types and like different monster types, the chest, the locked door, like all these things, items, like all these concepts that we could easily add in as we get more comfortable with objects and object oriented design. But in, in this case, once I've said, you know what I need, I need doors. I need barriers between the, the rooms and I want to be able to add in locked doors. I need monsters. I need like different room types. Um, a chest that's it that's an item in the room like all these things like it's really easy there's in fact there's nothing easier than to just hard code this and now i can just you know in my main program i can just say so i i you know i can just say new what i can do is this is kind of squishing a lot in here to get a level level equals what i'll do is say i'll make a new hard coded level generator dot generate so make a make a new one of these and then immediately ask it to give us a level and that's what we get here. So we've made two objects here. One of them is made right here. One of them is when we call generate and we make the level here and return it down here. I said we made two objects, but technically we made one here, new hard code level, 
We make a second one here, we make a third one here, we make a fourth one here, we make a fifth one here, we make a sixth one here. Presumably this door dot get key is probably gonna make a key object new chest. We're actually making a whole bunch of objects and that's like with object oriented design, you end up with this little interconnected graph of objects. And here, like the, the level knows about all these. Um, anyway, so now we can do whatever we need to with the level. And if I want to test out something, if I introduced, you know, um, I, I don't know. I, I introduce a new monster type, like a zombie. I can just say level dot rooms. We'll just put it close to, let's say the entrance is zero, zero. I can just put this in like a room right next to the entrance. Do. So other than defining the class for the, the zombie class, um, it's really easy to just add in a new zombie and then I can just go immediately to that room and test it out. Like, and if it's randomly generated, like I don't know, I don't know where the zombie's gonna be. I have to go hunt it down, which is kind of annoying. So having this like hard coded thing is really convenient. But um, I'm gonna split this up a little bit. Put this in a variable for the moment. Basically, I'm just splitting what was that one line into two. Um, the nice thing about so anyway, the, yeah, the nice thing about this is that like, now that I've separated it, one of the big things I get is at some point I, I am going to like, it's not, it's great to have this hard coded one. It's great for development. It's great for um, just like testing out stuff as I'm building stuff. But um, presumably, oh, I was going to say there's an, another thing that could be really nice about having this hard coded one is you could have even if even if generally you're doing the randomized thing um like there are other scenarios where you could use if you if this existed a hard-coded thing you could use it for example like a tutorial or like a uh, or demo mode thing where it's like you know exactly what to expect and so you can walk somebody through it like okay you click on this do this then now you have that um so having it gives you these options to to swap it and and that's like that's the main thing here is that at this point, like we can have a lot of code down here that like, while I don't know, you know, why the level that is not done a method or whatever it is, like we've run the game down here. There's a whole bunch of this stuff and, and most of the code doesn't care at all how exactly that got generated. So separating this level generation out away from the level class gives us flexibility to change our minds about how we generate levels, um, which is which is power. And that's like the thing about software is that it is soft and it it it, it like its greatest value is that it's changeable over time. When people change their mind about what they need it to be, when two different users are like, I need it to be this, no, I need it to be that. Like you can solve those problems. You can make it what people need it to be, that it is flexible. Unlike, I mean, people lump software development into engineering all the time, software engineering. Um, and they, they refer to it as engineering. The, the big difference between software engineering versus like civil engineering or mechanical engineering or aerospace or whatever, is software is something that is by and large trivial meant to be trivial at least to change you you make a bridge and you like you you don't change it like uh, there's there's often a little bit of room in in those engineering disciplines to make some adjustments but like you don't you don't go turn turn a, a two-lane bridge into a into a six-lane bridge you don't you don't take a bridge that was built to be big enough for, you know, a boat, a boat that's no more than 15 feet tall to get under it, to be something that can, you know, have a draw, a drawbridge and lift up and be tall enough for any boats to fit in either, anything like that. Like you just, you don't have that flexibility, but with software, that is its benefit is that it is, it's soft, it's flexible, it's malleable, you can change it. But in order to do that, you have to get the design right. Um, this book, this, this video, like th these are things that we can't cover all of that. Um, if you've done object oriented programming before, you're probably already fairly aware of that, uh, that notion 
that that's really the main goal of the software design of coming up with a good design for it is to make sure you have that flexibility. Um, if not, like this is consider this your first step down that along that journey. And there's going to be a lot more lessons to be learned in that. One thing I do want to do though, is give you a little bit of a peek at the future. Um, cause even still here, like what I've got is like, I, I, it's still like I, the code still knows exactly what's going on here. We, we'd make a new hard coded level generator. So let's, let's look very briefly at like, what would this look like if we said, we're going to make public class random level generator. I think again, I'm going to be making up a bunch of code here. Um, and it's, it's illustrative. It doesn't compile. And I'm, I am definitely including concepts that are still to come in the book. If you're at this point, which is fine. The point isn't to totally understand every character, every line of code that I'm writing here. It's to just get a feel for like, what's coming. Like, why does it, why, why have I bothered to sit here and how long is this video so far? Well, right now I'm 26 minutes in, which is good time, good pacing for me. I'm way ahead of, we'll see how long this goes. I'll probably end up with a two hour video. That's one of my weaknesses is I, I can talk and talk and talk and not necessarily make forward progress. So, um, anyway, so I made this, you know, random level generator. And, and if, if I make the public API, the shell, the, the, the way that it looks to the outside world, if I make that the same, then, um, it's, it makes it easy to change level, level equals the level. Uh, we're going to make it 10, 10 again. Again, this is one of the things that could have been passed in as a parameter, but, um, turn level, um, this thing actually at one point was suggesting I make yep, that guy, except I want the underscore. Um, so like at this point I can do random dot next. So like, I'm trying to think of how we would do this, but something like, um, if we want to add in a prison cell somewhere, we can just say level dot and just copy this code. It's mostly what I want. But what I want here is random dot next 10. There. Now this also doesn't compile, but like, so now it'll randomly place a, a prison cell and I can do the same thing with the throne room. Again, though, this is like that complexity I was talking about. I, I, I don't want the throne room to be, to like wipe out the prison cell. Like this shouldn't be the same as this. So I need to write some code to ensure that it doesn't, which again goes back to my earlier comment of, I very often take when possible, the simplest possible strategy and just hard code stuff as long. And as long as you have done the, the, the most important thing from like an architecture or design standpoint and made it swappable by separating it into its own little thing, its own little object. Um, it's, it's re it's trivial to swap one thing for another. And we'll see that here too. So anyway, um, and so for like one thing you could do, for example, here is like, I made this random level generator, but, um, we could, I could make two different level generators that do, that have different rules or guidelines for how it generates stuff. And I could compare the two. I could play several games with one generator and I could play several games, with the other one, and see which one is more fun to play or whatever. Um, I, I, and I'll, I'll say like, we're talking about level generators, but like, for example, it's really easy to imagine a whole lot of other things that could have similar volatility. Um, that's kind of a, a, a tangent here, but like, uh, for example, um, the player input, we, we could like the, the way the user interacts with this, like we could totally do like, we could do this thing with console input, which kind of gets back to the arrow and the, the console input that we had there. Um, we could, we could do, we could do this, you know, have the user control their character moving through this little level, this little 10 by 10 grid of rooms, um, by, by typing in commands like move South, move North punch zombie, like whatever it is. Um, they, 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 they could do all that stuff by typing commands or we could swap it and have it be something that's done in a graphical interface or, um, 
you know, a, a, a lot of so then you're pushing buttons and stuff, or you use like a gamepad, like you know, thumbsticks and, and the trigger buttons and a, a up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right. Um, I don't know. Great. And I don't remember the Konami code. Hang on a sec. Well, I think I just lost 17 geek points by not remembering that off the top of my head. Up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, BA. And then you had to push, like, start and select to get into the game. But anyway, <laughs> cheat code. <laughs> so, um,. Anyway, whatever it is, they could use a, a gamepad or they could, you know, or, or, or for example, we can make an AI player. Like, again, it's one of those things like we got different strategies here. We should separate that. That should be its own thing because there is competing ways that we could legitimately want to do it. And if we want to, if we want to preserve the ability to have flexibility along that axis, let's separate it so that all we have to do is make a, a new, a new class for it. Anyway, um, so in th and this point, um, what we have here are two different classes that they both just kind of look about the same, right? So what's nice here is like this code, this white space here, like if I just change this random level generator and put that, oops, put that here, like the, I didn't have to change, like none of the rest of this code cares which generator is doing it. I know two options and I can relatively easily just swap one for another. It gets better. C Sharp has a bunch of tools to make this type of like competing alternatives um, more flexible, more powerful. Um, one of those is inheritance. So we could do a public class level generator. And again, this is going into concepts that the book covers. Just not yet. I just, I still think seeing this little glimpse into the future is useful. And I'm, what I'm going to do here, throw in this abstract keyword. Don't worry about it. It just, don't worry too much about it yet. We'll cover it. Um, and then we can say, well, hey, this is a level generator. And so is this. And I need to put override here and override here. And now this, like at this point, um, like the, this variable doesn't even care what type it is specifically. It just knows that I have a level generator and all level generators have this capacity defined here to generate a level. So I don't care which specific object I have. I just know I've got something that can do it. And I'll just ask whatever it is to just come up with a level. I obviously at some level must pick a specific type. Uh, but now in order to change this, I don't even like I can most of the program, like all this down here doesn't care about which specific type I'm using. It's able to say, well, we'll just pick the right type, but you know, as it's running. Um, and then if, if, as long as you don't have any like meat at this level, the other thing looking yet another level ahead is we could use an interface. So that simplifies some of this and now I've got that. So this is just an I level generator. I is for interface. And now there's even less like we don't need, we have no clue anything about the actual type. We just know it's like it's something in the system that has the capacity to give it a level on demand. So now at this point you could imagine, depending on which item my user chooses in the menu, we could either you know, we could say, well, what kind of game do you want to play? Do you want to like load, load one from the level, from a level? Do you want to random, like play a randomly generated one? Do you want to join the competition that's going on online and, and connect to the server and get the level for the competition um, or whatever it is. And, and it would just, you know, you'd have something that would be like, poor man's version here, but If they type in a one in the menu, then we return, we do random. Okay, so they pick the random one. They pick option two, which is the um, the the server level, you, you know, new server 
level generator um, three. This is the loader from the file system, new file level generator. It's hard to call that a generator at that point, isn't it? Anyway, at this point, like, I didn't even know which version ran. Like, in the code, I have no clue, I, I, but I've accounted for it. And it's, but for me, it's irrelevant. I just know that whatever it is, I'll have some object that can do this. Um, and that's all I care about, is that it's going to get generated. Something will do it. And, and the user has the flexibility to decide. So anyway, um, I want to tie this back to the original thing about the arrows. Do I dare control Z all the way back to that? I don't think I'm going to do that. Um, the, I, like, it's one of those things that, like, the user input within the arrow class, it could technically be done. Like, it works. It's it's fine, especially for this challenge where we're at in the book. Um, that's the, the only thing that is ever needed out of that challenge is get it from the user. Um, so it, at that level, it's pretty reasonable to say... Um, we're going to just, we're just, that's just going to be the one and only way you do it. The constructor will just interact with the console window. Again, it gets back to that volatility thing. If you're sitting there saying, well, I have this, I have it, like, here's the work that I need. Do I need to get it from the user? Um, in that situation, you could look at it and say, well, are there competing strategies? Well, as far as that challenge goes as a, as an isolated problem, no. You, you will, you will never, that challenge does not need you to do anything else besides that ever. Um, and unless you are expecting to evolve that into something else over time, you, there, like there will, there's no, yes, you could come up with alternatives, but from a practical standpoint, none of those are things you'd ever actually do. So it could make sense to just say, look, I'm never going to do anything else. There's no volatility as far as that program goes. So I'm just going to leave it alone. I'm just going to put it in the arrow class. That is where kind of what I was saying at the beginning, it, it can be just fine to keep it that way, but you want to do it on purpose. You want to be doing it by saying, Hmm, is this an area of volatility? No, it isn't. Cause that, that's all the challenge needs. It's all it's ever going to need. I'm going to be done with, it. I'm going to walk away from that code after. It's, it's actually totally fine to just say, I'm just going to keep it simple. I'm not going to make two classes. I'm just going to have one class. It's going to do it all. Um, on the other hand, if I think, I think I would say it's good practice because so much code that you built as just a simple, really quick and dirty thing. So much of that ends up being something that you very quickly end up needing a lot of flexibility on. Um, so, it, so I think it's always worth stopping and thinking, should I separate it? is this vol is an area of volatility and and if if i can think of other legitimate competing strategies for doing this can i like do i believe that they're you know they could actually happen and that, is this something i want to account for and make the decision based on that instead of just oh, i didn't know what else to do so hopefully that gives you some options to think about um i feel like this has been a lot of stuff and it's probably very overwhelming what I, for somebody who's just in like the Vin Fletcher's arrows level, um, you know, stage of the, the book, what I would suggest is, um, don't worry too much about it. You could consider, well, maybe I'll pull that step out. Maybe I'll, uh, all right, fine. I'm going to give this a try. Hang on. All right. So, um, I was able to get back to it. So like I say, we're, we're looking at this and saying like, is, is this an area of volatility, this console input? And I think like, if you think about it there, like it's legitimate to say, I might, there's old scenarios where I might want to use arrows and not be directly tied to, you know, the console window to choose that. So even though I technically don't need it now, it is an area of volatility. And to that end, I'm going to not put it in the arrow class. I'm going to separate it. Um, so you could, if you did decide that, which again, this challenge, like you could, it's reasonable in this situation to say, I, I can think of other ways I might want to do it, but I do not need to do it. And so I'm going to keep my code simple. I'm just going to do this. That is a legitimate decision. Um, but the alternatives here are, it, it wouldn't be too hard to just say, you know what, let's just take these three methods and, um, 
for one, let's just put them here as local functions in uh, the main method, which means I got to remove the public on these. Um, and then, and then just make this something like that. I actually love how simple that's made this class. It, the complexity shifted over to here, right? So now the main method deals with that, but the arrow class itself doesn't have to worry about it. And now I can just come up here and I can say um, fletching type, fletching type equals get fletching type. This feels like uh, the department of redundancy department. There we go. Something like that. Um, so now this code gets it. And now like our arrow class, it doesn't care where this data comes from. This It could be something that's like chosen by the user, as we just had up there, or it's something that could be um, randomly generated. <laughs> or it could be something that's a hard-coded thing. We, you know, we've got a specific arrow type, and it needs... You know, it needs goose feathers and it needs a obsidian arrowhead tip and it's 88 centimeters long. Like we know that's it's a very specific thing. And we could just, you know, forget the user input. We could just say arrow, arrow two, great name, right? Equals new arrow. And we can just pick hard coded values here. Uh, what did I say? Fletching type dot, I said goose feathers, arrowhead type dot obsidian. A length of 88. I can make an arrow this way. I can, like I said, I could, I could randomize it. I could get it out of a file. Like I all, <laughs> the usual suspects, all these things I could do. And my arrow class now works with any of these things. I'm not locked into the console window thing. Not that you couldn't come up with a way to support both within the arrow class. Um, you could do that. I just like, this gives you, I, I think this design gives you extra flexibility. So it's what I would generally prefer. However, I will say that some people look at this and say, oh, that's a lot of dumb stuff. Keep in mind, this is an expression. Accessing a variable is an expression. Uh, calling a method is an expression. And usually where one expression works, every expression works. I can just take the result of get fletching type and not like that, do over. Just stick it in here. And then I don't need to make the pit stop in that variable. I can put this one here and I can put this one here. So this, when it comes over to here and it's evaluating this, it'll say, okay, I got it. I need to, I need to make a new arrow. But in order to do that, I have to evaluate this expression, which means calling this method and getting it stuff. So I'll run this code and get a fletching type. And now I have a specific value. But now I got to evaluate this, which means calling this method and getting its return value. And then I got to call this. And at some point I'll get values for all of those. And then I can actually call the arrow constructor. Um, anyway, that is enough about that. Let's see if I can summarize this really quickly. Um, the, the main point here is that I typically will separate like the user input stuff from my, like the arrow class or things like that, just because to me, it's a separate, it's a separate area of volatility. The way that you get this data um, is, is comes from like, it has nothing to do with the actual arrow class that doesn't care where this information comes from, um, which is part of that broader principle that, that, when you find things that you're saying, there's other competing ways that I could do this. If, if you're saying that there's, there's legitimate alternative approaches to this, and I might want to change my mind. Those things should be separated into different classes. The, the code related to one area of volatility should be separated from code that is unrelated to that area of volatility. Um, 
because it allows you to very easily just build swappable components in your software by new objects. And as I kind of illustrated, some of these concepts that are coming down a, a little bit later um, in, a, in a few more chapters, um, but things like inheritance and uh, polymorphism and interfaces that are these tools that the language gives you to make it really easy to swap these things. Um, so that's the basic concept is that you should, when, when things are changing for different reasons, um, then that's when you should start separating the classes up, you know, separating it into different classes. So that's why I will typically pull out my user input. Oh, I was going to say like one, another thing you could do here. I, I wanted this earlier. You could, you could, if you wanted to. There's no, I mean, we already kind of talked about this, but you could have lots of classes, arrow, maker. So this is actually kind of like our level generator. Um, we could have a public arrow and arrow. And we could actually move this code if we wanted into here. Now we just have, you know, another class. Now I can actually make these private. Oh, I can make them. I want to make them private, but at this point in the book, we haven't talked about that yet. I can put these back in here. The missing one. No. And now I can put this here. Okay. New arrow. So now I can do new arrow maker. Uh, something like that. Um, so if I do want it in a class, I could do that. I like, I don't know. Anyway, that's, that's the gist. If things, if things, if, if there's some area that you like, there's different competing strategies here. If you want to make it, if you want to be able to swap, if you want to be able to choose a different path later or be able to support multiple different paths in the same code at the same time. In those situations, it, it makes sense to separate that, that the code related to that decision, like we're going to get our arrow data from the user using the console window. You separate that into a different class, or in this case, we also use the main method. I think that's a reasonable um, thing in this case. So that you give yourself that flexibility as we showed in here. With especially with the board generator. Um, anyway, that's probably enough enough about that for now. Um, but anyway, like I said, if you're it's a lot to take in. Don't let it overwhelm you. It's it's going to be fine. Um, but it is something to like keep in the back of your mind as you're learning all these new concepts over about object oriented software development in C sharp. So that's all I've got for now. So. Thanks for watching and I'll see you guys later.